All right, so um, what's going to happen today is that this is meant to be um, an introduction to your constitutional rights as they relate to policing, as they relate to strategies for filming, documenting. Um, so what we're going to try to do is give you the orientation of, you know, why you have the rights that you do, what rights you have in those interactions, um, some strategies for dealing. Um, you know, we're certainly... Uh, you know, looking to give you skills and to welcome you. If you want to work with CopWatch, we are certainly always looking for folks to go out on shifts and to, um, we want to train you. So that's all, an option as well. Uh, we are going to show, we'll show some staged footage of police uh, aggression and some actual protest footage. Uh, we're going to discuss police violence and, you know, Murder. We're not going to show any of the most graphic, you know, we're not going to do that. We don't need to do that today. I do want to let you know that we're not lawyers. And that's a strength, we think, because <coughs> most of us walking out on the streets are not, um, are not lawyers. But cop watch is not the preserve of lawyers. You know, if you've got eyes and you, you know, and you got a brain, you've got all you need to observe and document police activity. But in terms of understanding what you're seeing, contextualizing it, and thinking through some of the possible uh, ways to respond, it's good to know the law, good to know some of the relevant general orders and uh, processes that are in, in, at work in any given interaction. Go ahead, next. So uh, we, I think it's important for us to understand in order to be what we are as cop watch that started in 1990 and that now there's cop watch groups all over the country, all over Canada. Um, these groups have this in common. They agree to, uh, you know, this idea of not, we're not violent, you know, we're not trying to violently resist police aggression and we are about actually directly monitoring police. We actually go out and see the police and make that stand. But we, we just wanna give, um, give honor and give context to this effort because the idea of challenging police abuse is certainly not new. Um, you know, we have obviously, you know, this goes all the way back to slave resistance to slave patrols, you know, and it, it goes on. Um, we go back to the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Now remember that they were patrolling their neighborhoods. They were doing it not with cameras necessarily, but with guns. They were ready to defend against police aggression. There were the Brown Berets, uh, a Latinx, um, actually it was a Chicano movement, uh, again, around self-defense. Uh, the American Indian Movement, they were all you know, challenging police abuse and police incursions into their community. So, you know, we see ourselves as part of that continuum of resistance. Um, next slide, please. Oh, and I guess I also just wanna say, I'm, I'm hopeful that people know this. I know it's been said a lot lately. Just that to understand why are the police so especially racist? Like what, what, what's going on with that? Why? And we have to understand that the origins of police in America have to do with the desire of slave owners to patrol, uh, not, only, not only to capture runaway slaves, but to maintain a patrol of areas where freed black people lived, right? Not everybody was a slave, but the white men believed that they had the right to, and they wanted to, they wanted to patrol those areas and control them. And, and preclude any organizing or resistance. Likewise, in the Northeast, we know that, that police began, policing began as a response to organizing that was happening, you know, the industrial revolution was happening. Factory workers were going on strike. So remember that there are waves of immigrants from Europe, coming from Germany, coming from Italy, coming with ideologies of anarchy, and remember the Communist Manifesto was written in 1849, right around, this, you know, right around the same time that policing was beginning in America. So it was about uh, taking over the factory floor 
and brutalizing people who went on strike. We also know that in the West, that policing began as part of this effort to deprive people of their land, to, to take Californios who uh, lived in California, who were of Mexican origin, to take their land from them. So, you know, there's a common theme here, folks. Just wanted to, you know, offer that context. And also, you know, policing again, as a, as a bulwark against, uh, you know, the claims of indigenous people to the right to their land. So, yes, just to give you the framework that, that we share at Cop Watch. All right, the history of Berkeley Cop Watch, you know, we've been involved in um, uh, a lot of, you know, what can I say? We started out uh, in 1990 as a response to a huge gentrification that was taking place, that it coordinated police and city services. They wanted to rid the area, not only of poor people, not only of unhoused people, but there was a lot of black youth were coming to Telegraph Avenue at you know on Friday and Saturday nights because it was like pizza and record stores and they like to, you know, kids like to cruise and meet each other and have fun, and and the powers that be, they didn't, they didn't want all that. So they sent in police to, you know, ticket them and harass them and to make, you know, tell the stores that they needed to close early. And it was just, a, it was an incredible um, and blatant uh, gentrification effort. Um, but over the years, we've been involved in exposing police misconduct in a variety of ways. Sometimes our footage has been used in court cases uh, sometimes we use it to publicize what we feel are unjust practices by the police. And this is a very abbreviated timeline. We have, you know, we have 30 years of history, which if you're interested, you can go to our website and look back under resources. We have a lot of that listed. Um, but yeah, we did hold the first national convention of cop watch groups. We were going to have a 30th anniversary celebration this year, but that got, that got, that got changed. Um, but we're proud to announce that after a couple of years of work with a group called Witness in New York, we have created a template, a database template, to help us bring together all the stories and anecdotes and incidents of police conduct and, um, and to begin to, to think about how we can use it more strategically. We'll talk about that more um, as we go on. Next slide, please. So the things we want to cover today you know, the principles of cop watching, what our legal rights are, which I think is the kind of the meat of our training. The three types of stops, uh, cop watching techniques, how to film, some pointers for that. Um, and, uh, and, and just give you kind of a taste of like, if we do good cop watching, if we do good documenting, what can we do? How can we strike back? And that's, that's where we'd like to end up um, as we go on. Next slide, please. So we are gonna talk about your rights under the law, but I think it's important for us to understand this, that, um, you know, what your rights are and how they play out in the streets are often not the same thing. So I guess I, wanna, I want you to understand that we recognize that there's a disparity but we're fighting for these rights. We, we, wanna, we wanna defend them, we wanna fight for them. Um, so we use the strategy of nonviolence to avoid escalating situations and endangering the person who is being stopped. That's what we've agreed to organizationally and for a lot of reasons, we have to proclaim our nonviolence. It helps to keep us safe as an organization. Um, but what we also understand is that uh, the dynamics of privilege are constantly at work. Whether you are a cop watcher, a white cop watcher, or a person of color who is observing a police incident, whether you are the subject who is white or a person of color, how the police respond over and over and over again, we see the dynamics of privilege and power playing out in those interactions. So we're not trying to tell anybody what they should do. And we hold no judgments about anybody. You know, 
about how you react in that situation. We have, we have decided that these tactics work organizationally for us. But, um, but we recognize when faced with a situation where somebody is you know, literally under the knee of a, of a law enforcement officer, you, you, you have to act in accordance with your conscience. And we respect that. Um, so does anybody have any questions about that? I don't know. I, 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 it's hard to know who's in the room, like if you're, what your experience is. And so um, I just want to invite your um, questions or comments. Um, okay. All right. Well, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just go on with that. Um, so our principles, we're, we at Cop Watch, we're starting from this, that we believe that it's important to film the police. We believe in de-escalation. And that may be different than other folks. Other folks may want to confront and fight it out. We go to our cop watch shifts without arms. We do not carry weapons. So our tactic is around de-escalation. We believe that the person who is subject of the stop, it's like a hostage situation. We, we want to do every, we want, our actions are not in support necessarily of some bigger political agenda. It, we're trying to support that person in that moment. So we're gonna to try to calm the police, we're gonna to try to calm the situation and do our best to get them out of the reach of police unharmed if it's possible. So we wanna support the rights and safety of the detainee um, through observing. We're hoping that our presence on the scene in some way can act as a deterrent to the police officer's violence. We wanna document and demand justice. We wanna follow through. We seek alternatives to policing. And we want to empower the, the community to, to confront the situation. So agree, disagree, you know, you're free. <laughs> and we understand diversity of tactics is, is, a, is a fact. And, and we have respect for that. So next slide, please. So now let's get into your rights. Um, and how these are all relevant to cop watching and interacting with the police. So the First Amendment, um, the right to, to petition the government for redress of grievances. So this is where our right to film comes from. So since we have a right to uh, address, uh, to ask the government to, you know, if we have a grievance, then in order to, um, you know, back up that grievance, you would need evidence. And so that's why you are, you know, allowed to film. Uh, that's where that comes from. So that is your right to film. So you have a First Amendment right to film the police. The Fourth Amendment right, protection against unreasonable search and seizure. So this is, um, the cops cannot take your phone, um, which is why we recommend standing out of, I call it snatching distance, but um, cause they, just because they're not supposed to take your phone doesn't mean they might not try to. So they can't take your phone, they can't search your phone. Um, they can't search you. Um, basically, if a police officer is asking you, may I X, Y, Z, then that means you have a right to say no to it. Um, and this also applies to you, your, your physical bodily self. We've heard lately in the news about the police um, uh, in Portland, for example, kind of um, just snatching people off the streets. And it happened in New York recently as well. Um, without um, a reasonable, uh, reasonable reason. Um, so the police cannot, cannot seize you either uh, without, you cannot be arrested without knowing why. The Fifth Amendment. So Many of us have probably heard, uh, I plead the fifth. So you have a right to remain silent, to use it. There is uh, never ever anything 
helpful that will come out of talking to the police. Um, it is illegal for you to lie to the police, but they can say whatever they want to you, and they will. Um, so do not, even, even a casual or thoughtless word to the police um, can be twisted into, um, can be construed as that you were telling a lie. It can be, can be turned into all sorts of things. Um, so politely declining to speak is, is always your best answer. And then a few other things that don't apply so much on the streets, but uh, a right to a speedy and public trial, a jury of your peers, um, a right to know why you're being arrested, that is important, and the right to legal counsel. And the Eighth Amendment. Um, these last two are often um, heavily, heavily disproportionately used against Black people and people of color. Um, to leave them lingering in the prison system. Um, we won't get into those so much today, but they are, they are your rights. And then uh, we also just want to note, we're not going to get into this a lot today, but um, all people on American soil are covered by the um, these constitutional rights apply to you, no matter your citizenship. So we're gonna send you um, a resources guide after the training today. Uh, and there's some really great links in there um, for all sorts of stuff, but especially for uh, undocumented people as well. And um, again, remaining silent will uh, always be to your advantage. And do not sign anything, do not sign anything. This applies to, to everyone. Um, and along with remaining silent, uh, again, do not lie. Um, and that goes into don't, don't provide false documents. Um, yeah, but just know that uh, the rights, these rights do apply to you. And if you go online, um, there are a lot of, uh, again, there's links to it in our resources page, but this slide references something called a Know Your Rights card. And this basically is a, um, is a card in English and Spanish that um, says that you don't wanna speak to the police and that you want to speak to your lawyer. And it, um, it would be up to you to decide if that was a good thing for you to, to carry around. Take it away, Andrea. Right. So, um, so when you when you're out cop watching, or if you are, um, uh, what can I say? If you're just if you're or if you get stopped, there's basically three there's there's three types of police encounters, and that's what we we I think this is the most basic part of of the training. What we have to keep in mind is that there was a little in, in the chat. There was a little bit of of uh, question about what well, Mariah was just talking to you is about the, the constitutional protections. So that's the federal government. Those rights that Mariah is talking about apply to every state in the union. Now we know that they're unevenly applied and that's what the struggle is about. That's what the fight is. So with our eyes on the prize, yes, I like the Bill of Rights. I like those first 10 amendments to the constitution and I'm going to fight for them. And that's what we're talking about. And so that, that, believe it or not, the federal, the constitution is at work when you have a, um, when you're stopped by the police. Um, so let's, let's go to the next slide, Mariah, and let's talk about those three types of stops. The first thing that might happen is that a cop walks up to you and just says, hey, how you doing? My name is Officer Friendly, I'm new in town. Can you, uh, what's your name? Nice to meet you. What do you do for a living? Where do you live? You don't have to do any of that. You need to be clear about, officer, am I free to go? Am I, is this part of a, is this part of your job or are you just killing time? You need to ask whether or not you are being detained. Now a detention is hey, different. Go ahead, Zuri. 
Is that you? Yeah, Zuri, I was just going to point out to the hand raise. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Zuri, you can ask your question now. Yeah. Help yourself, huh? I didn't mean to raise my Sorry about that. I didn't mean oh. to raise my hand. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, no worries. No worries. Um, so <clears throat> we want to make sure, are you being detained? What a detention is, is when the cop has a reasonable suspicion to believe that you may have been involved in some kind of criminal activity. A reasonable suspicion is an articulable fact that links you to some, some kind of thing. It's not a hunch. It's not, you know, a racial stereotype. It's not a bad feeling in their gut. It's a fact. A fact, for example, uh, if the police hear on their radio, they say, oh, well, we have a woman who is suspected of stealing from the game store. Oh, okay. Well, if you say, oh, it's a blonde woman with glasses and a gray shirt, that's an articulable fact. Somebody of that description, I fit the description. Okay, great. They would be justified in detaining me. All right. Saying that it's a white woman, it's not enough. You know, saying it's a black man, that's not enough for a legal detention. Now, when I am detained, I can expect these things to happen. I can expect that they are going to ask for my name and for my, uh, where I live. They're going to ask for my, um, they're going to ask for my identification. Um, and, um, and can I be right with you, Dad? Thanks. Um, my dad's here. When I get stopped, um, they're going to ask for my name and I do need to, I do need to identify myself and here's why. Um, in some states, it has been decided that failure to identify oneself is a way of delaying a police officer. In most states in the union, it is a crime to obstruct, delay, or interfere with a cop in the course of their duty. Fair enough. So in California, the law is different. That The interpretations of that are different than in Texas. In Texas, it's straight up a crime. If, if a cop says they want to identify you and you fail to do that, that's a crime. In California, it's not so clear. However, we recommend that if you can <clears throat> excuse me, give your name and address, you should do that. It'll make your detention shorter and it'll, it'll expedite things for you. However, there's no crime. If you don't have a, a driver's license, if you don't have a legal California ID on you, there's no crime in not having that. So don't let anybody tell you that. If you don't have an ID on you, you say, officer, I don't have an ID on me. Here's my name. Here's my address. And then you stop talking. Then the cop is going to do a pat search of you. They have, according to the judges, a legal right that if they have to stand there and hang out with you, they have a right to their safety, their perception of safety. They have a right to pat search you. A pat search is a search of the exterior of your clothing. It doesn't mean they get to go in your pockets. It doesn't mean, look, if they say, hey, is that your backpack? You can say yes. And they say, well, can you open it up for me? You don't have to. Remember, if they're asking for your consent, then you don't have to say yes. There's no crime in saying no. You just say no, officer. You don't have to say no, you know, go to hell. You can just say no. Thank you, any officer. I don't, I don't give my consent to searches. It's not something I do. So you have that right. What's gonna happen is that the police are gonna be conducting sort of like a mini investigation. They might go back and, and find the witness and have the witness drive to your location and either identify you or say, no, that's not the right person. If they positively identify you, that would qualify as probable cause. That's evidence. What the police are doing is looking for evidence. Most times you know where they get their evidence from? you. Usually you start talking or you, me, open our backpack 
and there's the weed or there's the drugs or there's the whatever they're looking for, the stolen stuff. It's amazing how many times we just give our consent and you don't have to. Um, and I, and, and it's true, yes, what they are legally allowed to do or supposed to do is not necessarily what they will do. They might just take my backpack and rip it open and look inside. I need to verbally say, officer, I'm not consenting to this search. But we, we caution you, don't physically resist them. Um, and again, as Mariah would say, and don't lie to them. It's better to be silent than to lie to them because lying to a cop falls under that obstructing and interfering with a cop thing. And you don't want to get tied up with that. So better to be silent than to tell them something that's intentionally misleading. Um, yeah, and... And you say, well, how long can they keep me on the sidewalk when I'm, you know, being detained? It, it's, it's up to the judge, you know, a reasonable amount of time. Now, look, just between you and me, most of the judges are older white men, and that's how they see the world. So what is reasonable depends on what is reasonable to an elderly white man. Not the same as you and me, necessarily. Um, so what's a reasonable amount of time? 40 minutes, mm, is that a reasonable amount of time? It's pushing it. Four hours, hell no, you know? So I've seen detentions go on a bit long. The other thing I need you to know is that uh, you do not have a right to know why you're being detained. The courts have held this, that uh, in order to facilitate the cops investigation, they don't necessarily want to tip their hand about why they've stopped you. So you need to know silence is golden. One of the first things the cops is going to ask you is going to say, excuse me, come over here, please. You say, officer, am I free to go? They say, no, you are not free to go. I'm detaining you. Where are you coming from? And where are you going? Those are the first questions they're asking you because they want to trap you. They want to create what they call foundation in, in lawyer talk. They want to start creating like, oh, well, if you said that you were coming from here, then why did you go over there? You said you're going to here, but over, you see what I mean? They want to start getting you tripped up. Better to stay silent. But then if they, if they do find some piece of evidence, if they do decide to uh, take you into custody, if you're, you know, then you've been arrested. Next slide, please. Or, yeah, thank you. Um, so in an arrest, here's what you have to bear in mind, that the police believe that they have some kind of probable cause to arrest you, either a witness or a piece of evidence or something that you've said, a confession that you've made, or the cops saw it themselves. Then they can arrest you. Um, you may, now arrest might result in, you might be given a citation, even for some uh, misdemeanor crimes, the cop could just let you off with a ticket, you sign it with a promise to appear, and it's done. Or they may take you into custody. If they take you into custody, they're going to do a complete search of you. So your right to refuse the search is now gone. You don't have a right to refuse the search. Um, and uh, you also can expect that if you are taken into custody, you will go before a judge and based on our right, what they call habeas corpus, corpus is Latin for body, show us the body. So instead of putting you in a dungeon for six months or a year or so forth, you're supposed to have the right within 48 hours to go before a magistrate, go before a judge and enter a plea of guilty or not guilty and to have your bail set. Now, well, I need to tell you that Weekends don't count. If you get arrested on a Friday afternoon, Saturday doesn't count, Sunday doesn't count. And if it's a Monday holiday, that doesn't count either. So you could get arrested on a Friday afternoon and not go see uh, a, a judge until Tuesday. That's the law and all its majestic equality. Um, next slide, please. All right, uh, Mariah's gonna show you a little bit of footage that can help you um, kind of grasp these concepts a little more. Go ahead, Mariah. What if police come up to me just asking for ID? Hey, hold on, man. 
Let me see your ID. Carrying an ID is required when you're driving, but there's otherwise no law requiring you to carry an Take ID. Your hand but in some states, police can require you to give your name if they have reasonable suspicion to believe you're involved in criminal activity. How do you know if police have reasonable suspicion? Remember, police need reasonable suspicion to detain you. So one way to tell if they have reasonable suspicion is to ask if you're free to go. Hey, hold up, man. Let me see your ID. Excuse me, officer. Are you detaining me or am I free to go? I just want to talk to you, man. What's your name? Are you detaining me or am I free to go? I'm not detaining you, man, but I promise I'm clean. For sure, don't got time man. to chat. Got to go. What if they don't let me go? Then you're being detained because the officer thinks there's some reason to suspect you of a crime. Let's see some ID. Excuse me, officer. Are you detaining me? Am I free to go? Turn around. Put your hands up on the wall. In that situation, you could be arrested if you refuse to reveal your identity. Technically, police can't make you identify yourself anytime they want. But on the street, withholding your identity frequently leads to a detention or even an arrest. If your goal is to just get the encounter over with, then identifying yourself might be your best option. But if you're prepared to fight things out in court, you can flex your rights by refusing to cooperate with random ID requests. There you have it. So again, please make sure that, you know, pipe up with questions. If anything, if you're not sure about anything, please go ahead and, um, and let us know in the chat. So now we're going to talk about the three different kinds of violations because they are dealt with differently by, um, do you have to sign the citation? Uh, excellent question. Let me, let me, let's go through that. So if you get an infraction, you have a citation, um, an infraction is the kind of crime, you know, violation that is punishable by a fine. So you don't expect to go into custody behind an infraction. However, as Lowell, you'll notice in the chat, do I have to sign the citation? Well, technically, no, you don't have to sign it. But if you don't sign it, um, the officers may take you into custody um, as a way to ensure, because what the, what the infraction is, that, that thing, that citation they're asking you to sign, you're saying that you promised to appear before the judge. If you're not willing to promise to appear, then the police and the law say it's okay for them to take you. So that's why most of us sign off on the citation. Um, the other part of it is that, um, yeah, and in a, it's an interesting thing also because with a citation, they say, well, let me see your ID. And you say, oh, gosh, officer, I, I left my ID in my wallet at home. I don't have it with me. The officer has the discretion, even though it's an infraction, to take you into custody, not because of the infraction itself, but in order to verify your identity. So that's why at that point, I would say it's best to show any kind of uh, photograph ID that you have um, if you don't want to be taken into custody. It's an officer discretion. Sometimes they will say, oh, it's okay. You know, I'll run your name and, you know, your residence and I'll just believe that you are who you say you are. Um, but if they want to be a real provocative, they will take you into custody and take you down to the station to fingerprint you and verify your identity. Um, you also want to remember that when you get a citation, you don't have a right to a, a jury of your peers. What you'll probably get is a retired lawyer who's acting as a commissioner or something, a low level judge who would hear those citations. And um, so you don't, you know, and they're usually pretty grumpy and they're not really great on justice. Um, so you don't have a right to a lawyer in the case of a citation. However, the next type of violation is called a misdemeanor. A misdemeanor is a violation that's punishable by up to a year in jail and or a fine. Things like trespassing, you know, petty shoplifting, um, you know, sleeping in a doorway, that kind of stuff, illegal lodging. Most of those are misdemeanors. Um, and that's the kind of thing where you can expect you probably will be taken into custody, but they could 
they could cite you. Um, what if a reasonable, so I'm seeing in the chat, what if a reasonable suspicion is an assumption? Um, what do we do about officers who use your refusal to be searched as a basis for reasonable suspicion? Um, technically, uh, according to the law, your, you know, asserting your rights is not supposed to be casting suspicion on you. Um, so really, you know, and again, that's not how it often works, but that's what we're fighting for. So yeah, should you assert your rights? I believe we should. Um, but you have to take, you have to calculate the totality of the situation to decide if you want to make that move. But yes, that would be a legally defensible move to make. Um, uh, other things about misdemeanors. Yeah, if you're taken into custody, again, you will not be, uh, you will be completely searched. I do want to caution you at that point, even still, you will, everybody's like, well, what about my Miranda rights? My Miranda rights. We all know from the cop shows, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be held against you. You have a right. They're giving you your criminal trial rights. However, I've, I've been arrested probably 30 times related to protests and other things. Never have I been read my Miranda rights because the cop is their own. They're not expecting you to con confess or to give them information that could lead to the conspiracy. Of a no. They arrested you for blocking a doorway. They arrested you for whatever because they witnessed it most often. So, well, again, what we have to do is we have to be responsible to remember that we have the right to remain silent. And I got to tell you that even if you go into jail, there are informants in jail, people who are trying to negotiate for a better situation for themselves. And if you start talking about your case, if you start talking about who really did it, et cetera, et cetera, it's very possible that that information will be used in some other way. So we recommend, and if you want to be savvy, if you ever find yourself in jail and somebody's asking you a bunch about your case, you know, I would be a little bit tight-lipped about it. Um, and finally, the, the other type of violation that there is, is called, a, uh, it's called a felony. And you've probably heard of that before. A felony is a crime that is punishable by more than a year of confinement. And we, we call the places where you go for more than a year is a prison. The place where you go for less than a year is a jail. Um, and again, with a felony, you do have a right to a jury trial. And one of the crises in this country is the fact that so many people are unable to come up with $5,000 bail, $50,000 bail. So hundreds of thousands of people are, are languishing in American jails because they can't make bail and not because they're guilty. And many, many, many people plead out. They, they agree to take a, a reduced sentence for a crime that they didn't even commit so that they can begin and get on with their lives because they know that they will never make bail. Um, next slide, please. All right, and there's three, we, we see that there's three types of police misconduct. When we go out on a cop watch shift, we feel like there's three categories that misconduct, things that we see that we don't like, might fall under. You might be looking at violations of the law. You know, there are, yes, do cops break the law? Mm, yeah, all the time. You know, do cops, you know, snort lines of cocaine off the dashboard? Yeah, that's very possible. That's, that, those scandals have been, you know, cops trafficking young women. Just ask, ask the Oakland Police Department. Yes, do they do that? Ask the Berkeley Police. Do cops steal? Sure they do. Ask Sergeant Fleming, who in the Berkeley Police Department would stop people, say, let me see your wallet, take the money out of the wallet and keep it and never put it on an inventory sheet. If you get arrested and you get taken into custody and they take all your stuff, they're supposed to give you a complete inventory of everything they took. Oh, strange. Why isn't my cash money recorded there? So yes, cops steal. Cops lie, cops, you know, commit acts. We had, you know, in Berkeley, we also had a cop who stole the drugs out of the evidence room for years. Um, never went to jail for that. Anyway, so there's cop crime. 
planting evidence, this kind of thing. Most often what we see, and, and, and I guess I want to caution you because when a cop beats a handcuffed suspect, that's a crime. It's not a violation of policy. Don't let them tell you otherwise. That's crime. But the other kind of, of situation, and, and probably more commonly seen by people who cop watch, are violations of policies. A law has been passed in California that says each police department has to post on their website their policies and general orders, which means that we have, you know, should police be allowed to use overhand strikes with their batons? In Berkeley, they're not allowed to do that. Those can be bone breaking blows and they're not allowed. But if you see them doing that, that's a violation of their general orders. So I encourage you, no matter what town you're in, to go to the, go to the website of your police department and look, do they have their general orders posted? Can you hold them accountable to those general orders? In Berkeley, we don't, cops are not allowed to use tasers yet. They're trying, but in other towns they have them. The carotid artery chokehold has been banned by most police departments, not the California Highway Patrol. You know, so there's all, you know, is it? Yeah, right, thank you, Carly, for sharing that. Um, yes, you know, another form of abuse, look, they put handcuffs on. When they put those handcuffs on so tight, yes, can you get nerve damage? Yes, you know, can you, um, so, oh, that's a great question, Angela. She says, well, what say if Berkeley cops come to another town for mutual aid, can those Berkeley cops then use tasers, et cetera, in another town? Ooh, that's a great question. And it's being debated currently. In Berkeley, for example, in 1992, the city council passed a law that said, uh, when mutual aid forces come into Berkeley, they need to be briefed on Berkeley's policies and practices. They need, you know, their weapons need to, they need to not bring and use weapons that are not used in Berkeley. But the Berkeley PD acts like, oh no, when that Berkeley, when the other cops come, they just bring what they bring, said Chief Meehan. They just bring what they bring. I don't know what they're bringing. Abdicating all responsibility, abdicating all accountability. This is the struggle, Angela. This is what we're fighting about. So excellent question. So we're looking at violations of policies. And then the third kind of misconduct that we look at is unjust laws. Laws that, that were intended to discriminate. For example, anti-panhandling. There was a time in the 90s when the city council in its wisdom passed a law that said you couldn't panhandle on the streets, that it was illegal to panhandle. Well, what is panhandling? If I, if I solicit somebody for donations on behalf of a organization, on behalf of Cop Watch or the Red Cross or somebody else, is that panhandling? Oh, hey, wait, is panhandling free speech? Am I not allowed to ask my neighbors for help? So what we did is we had to get video recordings of the law actually being enforced, when we had that evidence, we were able to create a class action lawsuit to actually fight at the, to, to challenge the constitutionality of the law itself. So as you can see, this is kind of a strategy that you probably would work in concert with other folks, the NLG or the ACLU or some, some other legal body to actually challenge, challenge the law itself. Um, all right. Next slide, please. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please let me know. So what we're looking at in, in this slide is, it's just kind turn, of uh, what Maria is gonna tell you <laughs> right now. <laughs> Boom. Um, so uh, these are just a few um, kind of highlights. Uh, Techniques is probably not the right word. I should probably change that. <laughs> Principles, uh, foundations. So the first one is just a note. Um, when you, so you have, you have a constitutional right to film the police. So you begin filming though, and they say, hey, you're interfering, or hey, you know, 
hey, you need to back up, or hey, what are you doing there? You know, anything the police might say. Um, uh, you know, officer, I am, um, I'm not trying to interfere. I'm just exercising my First Amendment right to film you in public. Um, well, you need to back up. Okay, I will, I will back up. And then you use your camera to point it down at your feet. Take one step back, film yourself stepping back and go back to them. Basically, you're documenting yourself complying with whatever orders the police are giving you. Um, some people say that uh, about, a, you know, you want to get as close as you can in order to, in order to get as much as you can on film. However, um, you don't want to, um, you don't want to make the police nervous. You don't want to escalate whatever situation might be going on. Uh, and you don't want to be accused of interfering. So again, a, um, about a, you know, a, a car's length distance is good. And as I said earlier, uh, I said you want to be out of snatching distance because just because they're not supposed to take your camera or your phone doesn't mean they might not try. So, um, so that's penal code 148 is interfering or obstructing, delaying an officer. Um, so just assert your amendment rights, uh, which is the next point there, your first amendment right to film and to watch. And, uh, and then also if you are asked to take a step back, uh, take a step back and document yourself doing so. And then the last one there, um, cops must be identified by a name or number. So as you saw on the last slide, um, you should be able to see the badge number um, of a police officer um, and most likely their name as well. And you, um, you can ask them for their badge number or their name. And, uh, and it's, it's good to, if you are filming and you can't see those things or they refuse to give it, you know, document that they, um, that their badge numbers were not visible or that their names were not visible or that they uh, refused to identify themselves um, because they are legally obligated to do so in the state of California. Yeah, yeah just, just, just to remember that, that different, different, different uh, departments have different policies about how police communicate with the public about their badge numbers. But what Mariah is talking about is the minimum is that you have to have it showing. The cop doesn't necessarily have to tell you, doesn't have to respond in that way, unless it's their general. Some police departments give you a business card with their, with their number on it. Others just remain silent and be kind of mean to you. So here's a few tips for, for cop watching specifically for us. Uh, so you want to approach the situation calmly. So let's say um, maybe um, somebody from cop watch uh, has, has notified you that this, you know, the scanner has alerted us to a situation happening somewhere. And so we're, we're rolling up to a specific place or we're walking around and we happen to see some, uh, uh, some flashing lights, and we're like, oh, let's go check this out. Um, so do not um, do not run up on the scene. They'll be like, oh my gosh, what's going on over there? Let's go. And, you know, like a whole Scooby pack roll up on the thing all of a sudden. You want to approach the situation calmly. You want your hands to be visible. So, you know, a little pre-planning. You've got your phone out or your camera out already. You're not going to be walking up on the cops and then you know, suddenly like reaching into your pockets a bunch and doing that. So get yourself situated, get yourself ready. Um, you know, check in with your own. If, you're, if your goal is to document, film and de-escalate, are you feeling escalated? You know, are you ready to walk calmly into a situation? So get everything ready uh, before you calmly approach the situation. Um, you wanna approach them where, you wanna approach where the police can see you. You don't want to sneak up on them from the back. Um, you want them to be able to see, you, you know, you don't, want to, the, you, you don't want to be behind the police the whole time where they're kind of like getting anxious and trying to look behind, you know, they're keeping their eye in one place and then they're also, you know, trying to 
watch you from behind. Um, so try to make yourself visible to the police as well and um, avoid escalating the situation. Um, this means, so we don't go cop watching if we've been drinking or doing drugs and we don't bring drugs or weapons with us. You don't want to, you don't, you, you don't want to bring anything extra to the situation that could um, give them a legal reason to arrest you. We use a scanner uh, to help us find situations that are going on. Um, you know, things are a little different right now during um, during COVID. You know, we're not all riding in cars together, so we've been doing walking shifts. So it's a combination of using the scanner plus, um, you know, walking around town, which is great because a huge part of Cop Watch is community building and building trust in the community and having conversations with people on the street. So it's good. Um, and then de-escalate with your body and your voice. So um, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit more on the next slide, but um, your manners, your voice, your demeanor are all going to escalate or de-escalate the situation depending on you know, how you're acting. And again, the focus of any cop watch interaction is on the person that's being detained, is on the subject of the police because they're the one that is really, um, uh, they're under threat in that situation. And we're there to aid them, not to get our like activist yayas off or whatever. Uh, but do assert your right to observe. Don't interfere with the police. Uh, calmly assert your right to be there. And, uh, and just announce that you are a civilian with, with Cop Watch. You know, we say we're here with Berkeley Cop Watch um, and we're a civilian observer. You know, it's not, a, it's not a secret. And again, you know, one hope is that we don't want to be there documenting um, atrocities by the police. We hope that those things don't happen. And um, sometimes, you know, people act different when they know they're being watched, right? So just your very presence can help to de-escalate a situation and get the cops, you know, behaving a little better. And uh, just to touch a little bit more on de-escalating. Um, so again, keeping your hands visible, your voice is calm, you know, where the cops can see you. You know, sometimes that one is, is difficult. So I was documenting something the other day and they were right around, uh, yeah, they were basically on a corner, on one side of a corner. And so it's like, I didn't want to be, I wanted to be as close as possible, uh, which, and I didn't want to be in the street. So basically like I was around the corner. So I was trying to put myself in a place so it's basically like the place where it was best for me to film and the place where they could see me were a little at odds. So I was trying to get a good view while also, you know, I wanted to be, I wanted to be totally visible. I didn't want that. I didn't want to look like I was like, like sneaking a camera around the side or anything. Um, and part of that also was m my intention was to be like a physical support for the person who was, uh, being detained at that moment as well, you know, that they, they could clearly see me as well and know that I was there to give them support. Uh, so give the police some space, take a step back if you are asked to and document it. Um, asserting that you don't mean to interfere, you're just there with your legal right to observe and film. Avoid quick movements and uh, and remain silent if the police are harassing you, you know. Um, again, you have the right to film. You can say that. Don't give false information. False information can even be in the form of, if they ask you a question and you say, I don't know, but you know, then that is lying to the police and that's illegal. So just don't say anything. All right. So we're going to watch a really short video. This is, um, this was made by, um, this is one of the people from Witness who helped us to put together or with whom we collaborated on creating our amazing database, which we'll talk about later more. And this kind of addresses um, some of the basics of filming, but also specifically during a protest. Uh, 
And this is a, like a four minute clip of a 12 minute video. The link to the full 12 minute video is in the resources guide, which we'll send out after the training today. So if you're at a protest and you want to document police violence, which I highly encourage you to do, there's a few things that you can do to make sure that you're safe and ethical and impactful. First thing is to know your rights. You have a First Amendment constitutional right to film law enforcement in public spaces. You just can't interfere and whether or not you're interfering is completely at the discretion of the police officer. So try to stay at least an arm's length distance away or at least like a car's length away. If police officers tell you to back up, it's best to comply. You can even film your feet to show that you complied and that you were walking away. Before you go out to a protest, it's a good idea to have a legal number. This is the National Lawyers Guild hotline written somewhere on your body or memorized in case your phone gets stolen or confiscated. Police do not have the right to take your phone, search through your phone without your consent or court order, but they might do this anyway. So it's important that before you go to a protest to have your videos and your photos backing up to a cloud so that there's an additional layer of protection in case you lose it. You also wanna have at least a six digit code on your phone, not the touch ID or face ID or pattern lock. If you are filming, try to just focus on law enforcement, not on anybody who's protesting. If you do share that footage, you want to make sure to blur out faces, any identifying markers, tattoos, affiliation on shirts, things like that. Remember, we're using our phones to expose law enforcement, not our fellow protesters and civilians. Film details are police officers using excessive force. What weapons do they have? How many agents are there? Are they working with different agencies? Are they holding their weapons? Do they have protective gear on? Are they using any hateful languages, slurs, things like that? We wanna be recording this. These are important details. If we're gonna use this footage for advocacy or evidence, a few other filming tips, try to hold your phone horizontally. You get more information in the screen that way. Try to take your elbows over your hips like this so they sit like a tripod so that your shot is steadier and isn't shaky. Instead of panning kind of rapidly, you want to have slow, steady pans to really be able to see what's happening for a lawyer or a journalist later. Don't immediately share your footage. You want to pause and think about if there's any um, identities that you need to protect or blur out. YouTube has a free blurring tool for this. Do you want to protect your own identity? Do you want to upload this with your name attached to it? These might be things you want to think about. Often we see that protesters footage is discredited, so we want to be able to prove that our footage is real and that we filmed it where we said we filmed it at the time we said we filmed it. Some easy ways to do that are to film landmarks, the outsides of buildings, uh, street signs, your home screen that shows the time and date, any kind of verifiable landmarks, things like that. It's best to let the footage speak for itself. If you use biased emotional language, it can hurt its chances of being able to be used in, as evidence in court. So if you do narrate, stick to facts only. Uh, timing is also really important. As we saw with the George Floyd video, the video was released after the official police narrative, which can make a really big difference in um, being able to highlight and expose those discrepancies. So before you share, take a beat, take a pause, think about what you filmed, who you could be incriminating and how you can make a bigger impact. Share it with an advocacy organization or a lawyer or a trusted journalist first. Okay, so um, touch back on a few of these things. Um, so when you are on, when you're on the scene, um, try to collect witness statements and get contact info. We have a form that we use when we go out with Cop Watch, and um, also um, that would apply, uh, you know. That's an ongoing thing. So when you arrive on a scene too, I wanna to just add, don't make any assumptions about what is going on. Cause um, you might roll up and think, you know, one thing and it might turn out something entirely different is going on. So just don't, try not to jump in with a bunch of assumptions about what is taking place. Um, try to talk to people that are there and figure out what's going on. Um, document, any injuries and arrests. Um, 
it's great to take in some physical evidence of the scene, like a, to, to set place kind of in a legal sense. So the front of buildings, uh, police, or not police, street signs. Um, and then also you can film someone else's phone to get that home screen with the date and the time on it. And um, you also want to write down, you know, afterwards, you want to write down your own narrative of what happened as quickly as possible um, to, you know, while it's fresh in your mind. We try to make contact uh, with the individual that was arrested, uh, and there's different tools for doing this. And uh, let's see here. You can also request police reports and radio reference is a good thing for uh, archive of, of police dispatches. So a lot of stuff there. And then as far as video summary, uh, to touch back on some of the things she was talking about in the video there, we've got safety first. This is both of yourself and of the people that you're filming. You wanna keep the camera on the cops um it's so so important not to post pictures and video of people protesting we know that this is being used against people to um harm and harass and arrest uh protesters outside of protests so um obviously don't post the like protest selfies um but also the other thing, you know, keep the cameras on the cops, you know, be mindful of what, what images you're taking and how you're using them. And also safety means, um, you know, have a buddy. We always go cop watching in, at least in pairs uh, because when you've got your eyes on the camera and on the cops, you need to know that somebody has their eyes on you, that somebody has your back um, so that somebody, you know, a, there's a lot going on at a protest, especially, and you don't wanna, you know, you could be, knocked over or jostled or something else could be going on behind you or a cop could be coming up from your back so uh always have somebody with you um you have a right to film once again we're really pressing that one uh try to get as many details as you can badge numbers uniforms you know in berkeley alone we've got three different types of police officers operating we have berkeley pd we have the uc pd and then we've got bart police so who is even there? And then in a protest, you know, the, the sheriff's department might be there or maybe the highway patrol are there for some reason. So uh, it's important to know which police are even there. Are they wearing PPE? You know, right now, um, everyone, police included, are required to wear masks in public. And um, we're seeing so much of that not happening. Um, the police are really, uh, it's just, an added layer of the way that police are putting people's lives at risk right now. What weapons are present and how are they using them? Um, you know, perhaps they're allowed to be carrying a certain type of weapon, but they're not supposed to be pointing it in the close range that they are. So documenting the types of weaponry that the police are using, you know, from nightsticks, dogs, beanbags, anything. Uh, again, verifying your footage, street signs, buildings, home screens, and film continuously um, as much as you can. When you present footage that has a lot of, you know, splices and breakups, um, if you submit that, excuse me, for a court of law, they're going to want to know, you know, what happened to the other footage. Well, why did you, you know, so once you film in particular, don't edit your footage. Um, keep it in one place. Um, as cop watch, if violence does occur, we recommend that you stay quiet when you're filming and let the footage speak for itself. Uh, as she mentioned in the video, um, in a court of law, there's the possibility that your film will be uh, dismissed if there's a lot of emotive or biased language happening in it. Um, especially in a protest setting, there's a lot of other people there. Um, you know, a protest is kind of different from one-on-one -on -one and you come across a situation happening with the police out on, you know, a side street near your house or something. 
there's a lot of people at a protest and a lot of people there to like witness and interact. You're gonna have a lot of people doing a lot of different things at protests. Um, so if you can document and get a clear video image of what's going on, that's really, really important. And then as far as, um, you know, outside of a protest, um, we still, uh, we try to document um, as, uh, as best we can and uh, practicing the principles of nonviolence. Um, but, you know, as we mentioned at the beginning, um, it's a very uh, personal experience, um, or if you encounter police violence, you know, what you're going to do in that situation, um, you know, is truly up to you, and also what privileges you hold in that in that moment um so it is our hope that knowing these rights and becoming more comfortable with asserting and expressing them is going to help you to make um the choices that feel right for you when you have to do them in the heat of a moment uh there are also some other ways that you can use your voice um in a situation that isn't like you know, just like yelling at the police and things like that. You can remind a person that's being detained of their rights. Uh, and you can do so, if you even wanna be more slick about it, you can do so by saying them to your partner, like, hey, did you know they don't have to answer questions? Did you know that um, they don't have to, you know, commit to a search? You know, or you can, you know, yell those outright to that person. Um, but using your voice in that way to remind somebody of their rights. And, um, and also, you know, if need be calling out, if an officer is doing something that you know he's absolutely not supposed to be doing, then putting that out there too. Again, uh, silence is always good, but, um, but your voice is there, it is a tool. Get something incriminating on film. So this is really important. Um, if you get something on film, what do you do with it? Uh, you know, there are reasons to put stuff out. Well, what do you do with it? Be strategic. Um, you know, there's film that has come out uh, right away. Um, for example, the footage of Jacob Blake, and uh, that resulted in immediate actions this week. Um, and, but you can get guidance on these things, you know, from your local cop watch or your local national lawyers guild and LG. Um, you know, if you're not, if you really get something heavy on film, um, you know, reach out to somebody and get some support there. You know, you don't have to do that alone because the police might come after you, you know, people might come after you for what you put out. So just be safe. And, um, can I interject there? Sure. Uh, I just want to, I just want to just alert people that some, some of the considerations that we have when someone comes to us with, with really, um, explosive footage has to do with, um, whether or not what we want to do is let the, let the police write their report, write their account of what happened first, and then let the video evidence contradict it. Um, you know, eventually, we also feel like it's important to contact the family. Imagine how you would feel if all of a sudden you saw on TV something about some family member of yours, but you, you but your family hadn't been contacted. It's not always possible, and it's a struggle. But that's those are some of our considerations. There's a lot to weigh, so that's all. I'm just saying that it's, um, you know, sometimes you know, and and knowing that sometimes it can lead to huge reactions by the public. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially um, what Andrea was saying about the police making their own narrative. So yeah, wait, the police are going to put out a statement about things. And so if you can wait for the police to put out a statement and then put out that video footage that directly uh, contrasts what it is they're saying, that's going to make a way bigger difference than if the footage goes out first and then they can craft their narrative around what's out there.
And let's see here, what to do if you're being arrested. So if you do find yourself actually being arrested, um, the police must tell you why you're being arrested, get that name and that badge number, remain silent and ask to speak to your lawyer. Um, you will be, you know, if you're arrested and you are taken to jail, you will be searched with or without your consent. But um, as long as they are asking you if they may search you or look in your backpack or, you know, your pockets or anything, um, as long as they keep asking, keep saying no. Um, Andrea said it before, but, you know, just practice extra caution. Don't talk to anybody really in jail, anywhere about what's going on except for your lawyer. And then you do have a right to those phone calls, but the police can listen into the calls to your friends and your family, but not your lawyer. So again, stay silent, talk to your lawyer. We're going to, in the, um, in the resources page, we're also going to include a link uh, to what's called a jail support form. And if you are gonna go out protesting, it's, um, it's a form that you can fill out and leave with somebody who's not going to the protest so that in the case that you are arrested, they can uh, help, you know, advocate for you more easily. Things are a little different right now. Um, be sure to wear your, uh, your PPE. Um, we in, in Berkeley, they apparently have not arrested anyone for, for not wearing masks, um, even though it is required right now. Um, but you don't want to give, you don't want to give the police an excuse to fuck with you, basically. Um, and definitely do document when police are not wearing proper PPE. We're seeing a lot of that. And um, yeah, I think it's very important to note. And just to know, um, the, so the, the three nights of curfew that we had, back at the end of May, beginning of June. Um, racial disparities in policing exist in the United States. Uh, we know this. In Berkeley, they were, um, they were already bad. Uh, in general, we were already aware that uh, black residents accounted for 36% of all traffic stops in Berkeley while making up roughly 8% of the population in Berkeley. So during the three days of curfew, this rate almost doubled. So 62% of stops in Berkeley uh, were of black people during those three nights of curfew. So hugely, hugely disproportionate. Yes, yes. So, um, so one of the questions, uh, you know, obviously the question of the day, what do we do? Uh, what are our options when cops abuse? What should we do? And, um, you know, over the, over the course of 30 years, I have seen some of the options on this list grow more and more anemic than than even they were you know before and they, they didn't satisfy before but you know for example police review commission there's currently on the ballot in berkeley uh a measure that you know to create a quote-unquote police commission instead of a police review commission sadly after manipulations by the berkeley police officers association and so forth the original uh the the current proposal looks nothing like the original and it's been stripped of any meaningful powers or oversights or, or checks, checks and balances. So, um, yeah, 
police review mechanisms, you know, you, you get to choose. Some people feel that there's value in having your doc, your, your complaint received, but we bear, I have, I, I served on the Berkeley police review commission. I, I, I knew that there was a fundamentally flawed process that favored the police blatantly, you know, to the, to the extent that they were able to look at all documents, all investigative documents, including the complaint and the statement by the complainant, but the complainant doesn't get to look at what the police said. The hell is that? So, you know, at this point, you know, like I say, you can, there are inter each, each police, uh, police department has some sort of internal affairs department where you can file a complaint with them. Um, they tend to have a higher sustained rate for complaints than police review commissions. So if you want it, the, the good news about filing a complaint at this point, I think it's even better to file it with the internal affairs if you can, if you want to deal with police. But the, the reason why is because if you want a police officer's personnel filed to, to get thick with complaints, that's one way to do it. And so, you know, if they go to court or something, there's something called the pitches motion, which lawyers traditionally file at the onset of any uh, kind of complaint, just to look at the credibility of the officer themselves. Um, so you can decide to do that, but you may not want to deal with some police officer going, I'm Sergeant so-and-so, you filed a complaint and I'm here to get information from you. You know, it never feels good. So it's a shitty option. You can sue in civil court. You know, if you have a serious complaint, don't, you know, if you, if you, what can I say? I, I would say don't, I would say go sue them in court. Yeah. But what you have to remember is that most of the day-to-day -day abuses by police are not things that they would ever be sued for because lawyers sue on this basis. They say, well, what are the damages? Did an officer illegally search your backpack? Were you affected? I mean, have you been, um, you know, losing sleep over it? Are you traumatized? Do you have injuries? Because the lawyer, they will sue and they will get one third of whatever they recover. So if you just have, you know, if you got your feelings hurt, if you had a, you know, if it was an inconvenience, you know, they're not going to take the case. Um, you know, I've had cases in Berkeley where I've got, you know, a man was pulled over and guns were drawn on him with the allegation that he stole his own car. Lawyer didn't want to take it. Not enough damage. Uh, I got a case where a guy was on his knees and shot by police with less lethal weapons. You know, lawyer, lawyer hesitated, lawyer didn't jump on it. That just kind of, that, that tells you how bad the situation is these days because if those cases are not enough to get sued about. So it's not a great remedy. You know, we've got class action lawsuits, maybe criminal charges. People are rioting in Wisconsin trying to get criminal charges brought against officers who shot a man in the back. So bad publicity. So. Community organizing. So the bottom part of that list is about, you know, depends on what we do. We need to take the struggle. You know, I think we need to deal systematically and point out the shortcomings in the systems and, and, the, and the clear and obvious structural racism and structural bias that's built into the system. But how do we get immediate relief? Some of the, so, so what we have decided is that we are going to track individual officers to the best of our ability. And we have created a database template that we are using as a way to bring all the information together. So we're developing profiles on officers, for example. There is a female officer these days in Berkeley who we've identified in a variety of situations as being somebody who takes a situation that's unpleasant and is able to make it rise to a level where the individual who was merely upset now is getting charged with assault on a police officer, you know, and she's doing it. We want to create videos and individual campaigns and so forth, targeting that officer, warning our community about that officer and putting heat on that individual officer. In, in my experience, that, that has far more of, a, of an impact than, than a lot of these other so-called remedies. But let's show you a little video about the database project. And I'd like you to look at that and see if that might be right 
you know, what, what you think, could that, could that work in your community? Let's take a look. That is a munition that's not supposed to be aimed at people at that distance. That is absolutely in violation of policy and practice. For over 30 years, Berkeley Cop Watch, an all-volunteer police accountability group, has been directly monitoring police activity in the streets. We have used recording as a way to deter police violence, as well as to de-escalate police encounters, document abuses, and advocate for justice. This video provides a quick overview of the database and tools that we, Berkeley Cop Watch and Witness, an international human rights organization, created to make it easier for us to organize the vast amounts of videos that we record and that people send to us. By improving the way that we manage our information, we can more quickly and effectively conduct investigations, organize justice campaigns, and challenge unjust laws, policies, and police practices it can also help us preserve the history of our fight for our rights and our resistance to increased police power and gentrification. We hope that these resources can support others in doing the same. The Berkeley Cop Watch database allows our volunteers to search and enter data about incidents, officers, types of force, as well as link to multimedia, documents, and other information related to particular cases or people connected to the incident, such as witnesses. For example, we can conduct a search and see how certain types of incidents build up over time. For example, we can look at incidents related to homeless encampment raids. We can also see incidents involving a specific officer. This can serve as an early warning system when it becomes clear that a particular officer is implicated in multiple incidents and has a developing pattern of abuse that we can demonstrate with the help of quick access to video that involves that officer. Each officer profile allows you to add identifying information and images and track officers over time as they move through ranks and or change departments and the incidents that they've been involved in. And here is an entry for an incident related to the officer. You can see that the form collects basic information like time, date, location, as well as a narrative description, tags, related media, documents, notes about permissions or security concerns, and follow-up actions for monitoring the case. To enter data, volunteers can fill out a simple form, which makes it easy to capture information when returning from a cop-watching shift. To support our volunteers in using the database and ensure as much consistent data entry as possible, we created a controlled vocabulary and a data dictionary that outline what data is included, how it's structured, and how it's defined. We've also made these materials available for you to review and to adapt for your own needs. We created this database using FileMaker Pro. We also made a FileMaker template, which is like a blank copy of our database that you can download for free and adapt. You will need FileMaker on your computer for this. But you don't have to have FileMaker Pro to set up a database similar to ours. Check out our data model diagrams, which you can use to create a database with other platforms or software. Building a database is no easy task. We hope that our efforts can serve as a resource for other organizations who are collecting media and information about police abuse. Learn more about this project and download these resources at the link below. Okay, so um, just right away, does anybody have any questions about this or any responses to the video? Does that, is that anything that, feel free to unmute or raise your hand or however you wanna, but uh, 
we spent a goodly amount of time putting that together. <laughs> um, Robin, you're on the call. Do you want to? Do you want to make any? Uh, thank you, Lowell. Do you have any uh, thoughts you want to share? What what's what what work have you? You want to share a little bit about the work you've been doing, just helping other groups to make that functional? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think if there's questions, happy to address them. But I think that video does a great job. I'm working here, and it's been a slow start, as I think it'll be for a lot of us. It moves in slow and fast spurts. But uh, working here with Abrito in New York, this uh, Abrito is based in Sunset Park, but really a lot of that's with Dennis Flores, who is a person who's run that organization, but also been a from people all over the city has been someone who's been a long-standing uh, person with this in the movement. So working with him to help, he was an early driver of some of the tools that went and thinking that went into that database with uh, from the witness side, because witness was working before any of us got involved with them uh, with a bunch of his videos and created some early resources. Uh, but there's also now this, we're just getting into the actual nitty gritty of he has a bunch of tapes, he has a bunch of years of footage, and he has his own case files from when he was able to get a lot of the um, police information from his own, one of his own cases. So he's really, we're thinking about how do we create educational opportunities through a database? Um, how do we do training? And also um, more immediately, there's a pro project that he's working on with a bunch of cop watchers to hear where there's a giant police force and a bunch of different districts, and, and it can be really hard to know who you're going up against. It's also about trying to get at a lot of the protests who are the officers who keep showing up, getting pictures of them, trying to use the database to create that. So we're, but, you know, it can be slow moving. I think it's just something where we're in it together and learning how to work with a new tool. Uh, so I've been volunteering with him and we're working to sort of get through that process. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, um, so we've, we've been working with a number, we've been really trying, you know, we, it took us a while to get that database together. Um, and, you know, our hope is, is that we will get a lot of people, like I, I'm a middle school teacher. Look, I got middle school kids that are having interactions with the police, you know, that a lot of times don't get recorded. You know, the kids just like feel like it's part of the landscape and they just, you know, and they don't want to tell their parents because because they're afraid their parents are going to think they did it. There's high school kids. There's all kinds of people who are getting stuff on their phones and don't know what to do with it. And and what we're trying to do is work with groups that are willing to be the curators in their communities, the 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 focal point to to receive and archive and curate these collections so that you can say, yeah, which officer has the most violations, the most incidents? Let's let's analyze. Is there something wrong with that officer? Let's write a letter. Let's do a visibility campaign. What about uh, 5150s and mental health? You know, I don't know how many different communities are represented on this call, but I'm curious to, to know uh, in your town, you know, in California, there's something called a 5150. 5150 is the legal authority by police, medical doctors, or psychiatrists to be able to uh, take somebody and do a vol involuntary hold on them. The vast majority of 5150 calls are police responding to somebody who's schizophrenic, has a developmental disability, but, you know, looks suspicious. Police shouldn't be responding to those calls. Police should not be the ones doing wellness checks. Police should not be responding to calls that other much more well-qualified people could respond to because half of the people who are killed by pe by police are people who have some sort of mental health issue or disability and that and so so our documentation can help to build that case and build that pressure and justify the the, the truth of our claim um lawrence you have a question or uh, your hand up and i'd love to hear your thoughts well um that's uh, wonderful comments andrea the uh the situation in Boulder, um, in the past year, we had two um, incidents, um, both of which were recorded and became, uh, became lawsuits against the local police department. So uh -huh. we, have, uh, we have experienced this. We only have 1% of population, black population in, uh, in, in Colorado. So, and probably it's less than that in Boulder. Um, but I, the, the issues, uh, I guess my question was originally, 
uh, how many communities across the United States actually have uh, programs like the one you started in Berkeley and um, in a in a in populations where I guess the uh, the abuse by police is relatively um, seldom um, do you do you like recommend the use of a scanner so that somebody in the community who cares can go out and monitor what's going on yeah I mean, what are, what are some of the parameters for small communities with relatively few cases? Um, one other thing is we have at least one police officer who has that three inch thick portfolio of, sure. of abuses yeah. and they just keep moving them around uh, yeah. different places and so on. So that's a, a truism uh, regarding how that works in, in the department. We have a new chief of police um, and there's going to be a public presentation of her um, ideas about reforming the police department in Boulder uh, next week. So I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, any more comments about uh, small communities and this kind of program? And let, me slide us, let me slide us out of the, the slideshow so we can see each other. Sure, sure. So hold, that's a great question. Let's hang on to it. So I just wanna, you've all had a chance probably to read this slide. By now so if you take away anything today take away these statements you can find them uh, you can find them online really easily too um, but practice saying them practice saying them uh, on your bike or in the car on your way to the protest uh, so that they're ready and in your mouth and on your lips you know when you need them and uh, yeah Hang on, hang and remember, on. Remember, get the badge number. Yeah, get the badge, the badge. number. By the way, in sign language, that's cops, so. <laughs> get the badge. Um, yeah, so I wanted to, I wanted to address um, Lawrence a little bit. One thing I wanna do is, is just push a little bit on your perception that there's relatively uh, fewer incidents of misconduct. And, well, you know, well, I guess the reason why I wanna, I wanna press on that a little bit is because how do we know? You know, and if we were gonna stay evidence-based or fact-based, then we have to question our, you know, how we're gathering that information. And, uh, you know, the perception is like, well, you know, what's the, you say it's 1% of Boulder is African-American. You also um, have other people of color communities there. Um, and you know, are we depending on the police to report out? And if we're only depending on the police to report out, then I, then I just want to, I just want to, I just want to, whatever, highlight that that perception, and just just ask us to reflect, like, how do we know that that's true? One of the things that I've done over the years with folks, you know, we have cop watch groups, but remember, we are all volunteers. We don't have paid people. We don't have um, you know, an executive director, cop watch groups form sometimes, you know, in somebody's kitchen, you know, sometimes, and, you know, we have one, uh, we have one, you know, in San Francisco, you know, that's a huge city. And the cop watch group that I'm aware of is, um, you know, operating out of a friend's apartment. And, and that's, that, that limits growth. A lot of people won't approach and join a group that doesn't have kind of a neutral meeting spot. What we've done at Berkeley Cop Watch is we've moved a lot. We have an office, but we have a weekly meeting that's on Zoom. We invite people to come an hour early to kind of hang out and talk with us so that we can understand if they're, they're looking to join Cop Watch or they just have an issue with the police or whatever. But that, that's a good space. Um, but, but it's about advertising. It's about reaching out and who you're reaching out to. You know, my experience is that you know, some of the black churches in Berkeley have lots of anecdotes about police misconduct, but they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily know where to go to connect their anecdotes to the database. And so that's our job is to reach out and try to build trust and try to build networks that, that can hold our local police accountable. Um, anyway, go ahead, Cleo. Yeah. Um, I want to just draw our attention back to some really good questions that came up in the chat earlier, both Jason Quinn and then also Suri. So Jason Quinn were asking, 
Um, if we could talk a little bit about how the period of time one can be in jail before being seen by a judge has changed, like within COVID, um, any new, are there any, do we have any knowledge about new, like, practices around that? I think we have to, uh, what can I say? Different counties are creating and following, or not following, different guidelines that they've created. Um, but the Constitution remains fixed. So we have a constitutional right to appear before a magistrate. Court decisions, federal court decisions, Supreme Court decisions have created those, those, those specifics around 48 hours and so forth. There are some counties that are saying in order to redu re reduce the prison population, let's divert, let's not take, you know, if something is a wobbler, if it could either go, you know, I could take you into, into custody, or I could have you sign a promise to appear. Some are taking advantage of that. I'm not aware of, of, of them trying to put more people into the jail. My, my information tells me that they're trying to actually not have as many people in there. But if you have something that contradicts that, I welcome it. I welcome you to share. Um, and then there's ahead. also another, I think, important question came up from Zuri was, so we've been talking a lot about filming, filming the police, um, and they're asking, um, do any suggestions for unhoused or marginalized people who are harassed? Um, they said specifically due to homelessness, but I think this is just a broader question, people who might not have access to video recording, what other ways can they document in a way that's like, yeah, how do, how do we can provide good info on how to interact with the rights provided in this forum, but what are the choices to document if they do not have video or camera? Yeah. Well, one of the most, uh, the folks I know, the homeless folks I know who have been the most successful have done Facebook um, streaming, Facebook live stream. And so uh, it, it stays there and you can recover it, you know, after the, after the incident's over. So rather than having some fancy camera or something like that, if you have a phone, if you can, if you can do that, that's, that's one way. Um, others, uh, other people, does anybody else have any suggestions? You know, I know people have put stuff on, um, you know, other platforms, Instagram, and, you know, get tweeted about incidents. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, so Carly was saying that with the Sac Homeless, the Sacramento Homeless Union, they have a form to take declar declarations as an alternative to cameras. I know that when we do birthday cop watch shifts, we also take down like a form of notes that we then also do put those notes into a database. Um, so that I think is another yeah. way to document. Um, I think people think of like the video as something that you need video because then you're going to post it. But again, if we have, if we start having more and more of these databases, then having a written account of something also functions to put into a database about like what, which officers, Mark, you know, which officers did what misconduct. And it's worth, it's worth noting the, the database that we've been talking about. Um, and I know someone asked also what gets done with videos. So maybe it's going to be a conversation about the idea of archiving videos. All these, there's like, as, as has come from many years of conversation uh, between Andrea and some of us, and some of us, um, you know, me and some of the witness people, the archive versus databases versus curation are, are, I have an archival training and a background in that as an editor. So there's some of these terms mean something for those of us that work within a professional way, and then it can get all kind of blurred together. But the database is actually based around the idea of actually the incidents themselves. So it was based around the incident report mo document that Copwatch has been using for years, and a lot of other Copwatch at Berkeley has been using, and a lot of other Copwatching groups have a similar way that you fill out and you know and you know as Andrew said and other people we don't actually always as pop watchers come back and fill out a whole form but when you start to learn the structure of that form it's actually a structure similar to how we structure data so you start to think about what am I seeing what do I have to remember as details what are the things I need to remember later and so testimony and also testimony from someone who's been prepared to know oh if I'm going to remember and look for certain things as they're happening I'm more likely if I've already trained my brain to look for that to have it later and the database doesn't actually require video. It doesn't have video stored in it, but it points to video, but also fundamentally it's about what happened, tracking different accounts of it, taking the story of what happened. And so you can, after the fact, 
kind of work with people if there's someone collecting it. So the database strategy is partly to help answer that question of if unhoused folks or people who don't have cameras know there's a place they can go or people they can talk to who actually want to use that testimony for something. That's also a strategy that can be even more powerful than, than sometimes the camera footage itself especially if there's no relationship. Camera footage with no relationship to the community and no one with no politics behind them doesn't necessarily lead to successes unless there's also a community around it. Yeah, excellent. And I would add also that, um, so we, we will um, interview people sometimes afterwards to help them document the experience and put it into the database. Um, so encouraging people, I would say, without a camera or anything to at the very least get, um, a name and a badge number if they can, because at, again, at the very least, having those names and badge numbers in the database connected to um, you know, an incident of abuse of power, at least allows when you do a search through the database um, that you're still gonna, you know, it's still gonna pop up who your like problem officers are if you're trying to uh, create a campaign to, to target certain individuals. And you know you might not have as much footage to back it up, but at least you're gonna have a more accurate picture of like who the actual problem is. Fair enough, yeah. Feel free to put more questions in the chat or just raise your hand to ask them live. Um, just really brief questions that came up, uh, questions about minors and um, like the, inf are there any other info they need to give in terms of name address when they are detained? Any other differences with people under 18 years old? Yeah. People under 18 years old, it's a weird thing because <clears throat> on the one hand, they're considered to have all their full constitutional rights. On the other hand, uh, for example, in California, it is uh, according to the law that, that minors police have to contact the parents or guardians of a minor within one hour of their arrest and failure to do so is a breach of the law not just a policy it's also uh, the law that when a student is at school that the that the school takes on sort of like the the, the parent role we are we're, we're the legal guardians when when you're at school so if a police officer comes into the school and says i want to talk to this kid <clears throat> I want to search them. The kid can say, no, I refuse. I won't speak to you and I won't submit to a search. However, if an administrator, a vice principal or a principal decide, <clears throat> oh no, we need to search these kids. If they have a reasonable suspicion to believe that the kid may have contraband, something that they shouldn't have in their backpack, law says that they can search the kid <clears throat> and that they are justified in suspending them or taking action against the kid if they fail to respond to the directives of the administration. It's also the law that uh, lockers, cars, these kind of things, if they're on school property, the school can search them without a warrant. You know, and that includes like sniffy dogs looking for drugs. That includes a master key that opens up all the lockers. The law provides that that's all legal. And so kids should think of their locker as a public space. And even their car, if they want you know, full constitutional protection, don't park on school property. Um, yep, yep, sniffy dogs go crazy. Um, I saw a little thing in the chat, which was somebody was asking about a cop watch shift and what a cop watch shift looks like. And well, here's what I want to tell you is that I have talked to a lot of different cop watch groups and I'm, I'm just so impressed with the creativity and the variety, the strategic variety that people use depending on their situation. For example, in Berkeley cop watch, we do walking shifts and car shifts and bicycle shifts. But what's common to all of those is that we go with partners. If I'm videotaping, you know, if I'm using my camera, I'm paying really attention here. I don't have situational awareness. And what you want to do is, especially if you're in a protest situation, it's good to have a partner. You know, you go ahead and get the footage, and then your partner is like looking at like, oh, oh, look, they're coming, you know, to, to stay safe. So 
I know some people like to be the Lone Ranger and like to, you know, it's you're quicker, you're faster and stuff. You're also more vulnerable. And that's just a fact. When you're not in a protest situation, we use walking shifts as a way to introduce ourselves to our community. We walk up to people, hey, here's a Know Your Rights card. We have these little Know Your Rights cards, which you can find on our website and modify to your liking. Here's a list of phone numbers that could be helpful to you if you get stopped by the police. Here, and, and some of your basic rights. Have the police have been respecting your rights? Have you seen a lot of police activity here? People will begin to get, we'll, we gather intel on what the police are doing. People will tell us, <coughs> excuse me. So there's walking shifts. But when we really, really wanna have a lot of police contact, what we do is driving shifts. And when we do driving shifts, we like to have four people. We like to have two sets of two in the car. We're listening to a scanner, a handheld scanner that is able to scan many channels all at once. It goes through it, through it, stops when it hears something, and then resumes. So that way we can hear the most dispatch activity. That's not the only way that the police department or police are communicating with each other, but that's the public. That's the, when somebody calls 911, that's the dispatch recording. We listen for that. We listen for locations. We drive to the location. We, I, I like to drive past the incident to confirm that it's actually happening. Then we drive around the corner. We let two people off and they go scurry up to the situation. The other two people safely park the car. Two people are closest to the exchange between the cop and the subject of the stop. Somebody is videotaping, somebody else is writing down notes, asking people, did you see what happened? What, you know, who knows? Maybe you've just happened upon a stop where the people called, those are the people who called the police. So you have to, you have to stop and watch first, understand what's happening before you become an activist or before you get all involved in it, understand what's happening. Maybe this is an informant. Maybe the police are having a conversation with somebody who's getting paid to talk to them. So don't wonder if they tell you to fuck off because they don't want you to see them doing that. So we go around. Did you see what happened? Oh, the police came out of nowhere. Oh, they hit the guy. Oh, so you could be gathering. One of you can be gathering phone numbers. One of you can be videotaping. <clears throat> Again, there is no prescribed legal distance that you have to be. Look, if it's a jaywalking ticket, you'll probably come really close. If it's an accusation of an armed encounter, they'll probably keep you farther away. So it varies. The reason why we like to have two groups is because this group is close to the action, right? This group is there watching how the police interact with this first group. If the police are messing with these people, we want these people to get it on video. That's how we protect ourselves. Now, that's how we, that's the structure we use in an urban environment. If you have a cop watch that's just getting started and people aren't really very comfortable or confident or well-trained, we've had situations in San Jose like where they say, hey, everybody just come on Friday nights at seven o'clock. We'll do a quick know your rights training and we'll send you out in groups of two in different directions. And then we'll meet back up at 10 o'clock and debrief. That's a, that's a, that's a way to build people's you know, something, it's scary. It can be scary. So that's a way where people feel supported, feel like if something went wrong, they could get support. You know, you've got everybody's phone number. You're on a little text chat. You can say, oh, the cops have stopped us and we don't know what to do. Then everybody can, you know. So that's a walking shift. Now, in rural areas, you might want to try a different strategy. <clears throat> we were talking to some people up in Sonoma. What they want to do is, is get people on a, on a, uh, a chat group and drive around and listen to, uh, you know, you, there's an app called Broadcastify. I recommend it. It can only listen to one dispatch, one radio frequency at a time. So it's not scanning, but if you know which department you're interested in tracking, you can be listening to it. Like sometimes, like when I hear sirens in the middle of the night, I'll get up and go on to Broadcastify just so I can listen to the Berkeley PD and find out, and a lot of times I can find out what's going on so then I can know if I should 
put my shoes on, I'll go back to bed. Um, so this is the kind of idea. So you have to adapt it to your things, but you know, we go out for two or three hours at a time, you know, and uh, yeah, that's what, a, that's what a cop watch shift looks like. We come back to our office and if we have any footage, we upload it to our computer. We fill out the database form so we can track it. And, and that's, uh, that's a complete cycle of cop watch shift. Um, any other questions or comments? It's, it's one o'clock, so I'm, I'm aware that we, we said we go to 11 and one. But if anybody, you're welcome to jump off and we won't think that you're being rude or, or you know. We do encourage you, if you want to join Berkeley Cop Watch or get involved with us, please contact us at berkeleycopwatch at yahoo.com. Email us, let us know, and we'll send you a link, a Zoom link to our meeting. If you want to, um, if you want to, if you're from a different town and want to strategize together, I'd love to work with you. Uh, Robin um, and Mariah both have, have helped groups to uh, begin using the database. And um, we can talk to you about, do you want to get a copy of FileMaker Pro? Do you want to do some other thing? We'll strategize with you. We know we took, it took us a couple of years to get it functional. So we know a lot of the pitfalls that, that can happen on your way to implementation.